<clears throat> Good evening, everybody. My name is Darren. I'm going to be hosting this DBQ overview and how to write a thesis and contextualization today on 429 uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific and all those other times in between. Uh, so let's get started. Good evening, everyone. So don't forget that Fiveable covers a wealth of AP topics um, from math to English, social, stu social studies, sciences, histories, you name it, we've got it. We're here to help you check out any of our live events for free. And don't forget to think Fiveable wherever good uh, social media is sold. We're, at Twitter, we're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, you name it, wherever. And don't forget the Five Bull Olympics, fivebull.me slash Olympics. If you want to join, it's going to be a blast. So let's get to it. What's going to be in this stream? First, a little introduction. That's going to be who I am because most of you have never seen me or met me before. Uh, we're going to talk about what the DBQ is anyway. Should you be worried about the DBQ? Why it's important? Ne get on to the nitty gritty. Uh, I'm going to give you a sample rubric. It's my own. Uh, we're going to talk about So far, so good. I hope you guys are uh, here with me. Any any questions so far? Great. So let's start with who I am. First of all, my name is World in AP European History, uh, and I teach here in Henderson, Nevada. For those of you that are not familiar with the area, it's near Vegas, but not the same. We have our own mayor, we have our own municipality, the whole bit. We just happen to share a valley. Uh, why are we here? Well, we're going to go over the DBQ. We're going to talk about thesis. We're going to talk about contextualization. We're going to try and make it so that you Euro folks can really have the best bet you possibly can for this upcoming AP exam 2020. And uh, those of you that aren't in Euro, this is applicable to just about any AP history. Um, it's not necessarily applicable to government, but AP World, AP Euro, A push, it's all there. So let's talk. So what is the DBQ anyway? Because, you know, some people might be a new concept for them. Uh, the DBQ is a document-based question, DBQ. And it is just like it sounds. It is a essay that you need to write based on a question given certain documents. So what is it normally? What is it normally? Well, normally it makes up a part of the Free response questions uh, section in the EAP exam, which is rated around 20, 60% of the overall grade on your AP exam. And uh, if you do well in the DBQ, the LEQ, the SAQ, you know, document-based question, long essay questions, short answer questions, all together you do well on those and you kind of do okay on the multiple choice, you can still do very well and even get like a four on uh, the overall exam. But this year in 2020, things have changed quite a bit. If we're, in, we're under a global pandemic. A lot of us are stuck at home, and so as we've seen, 2020 is a little bit different, and the AP exam is no, no different either. It is, well, excuse me, it is different as well. I apologize. Um, <clears throat> just like life is different, the AP exam is different. So should you worry, be worried about the DBQ? The answer, no. You should not be worried about the DBQ. Why? Well, because first of all, it's a DBQ. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's talk about the differences between an LEQ and a DBQ, okay? Let's let's talk about the differences because that's really important. The differences between an LEQ and a DBQ, the difference between an LEQ and DBQ are many. Thank you, Harper. I appreciate you asking that. Um, so the difference between Differences between an LEQ and a DBQ are many and few. Let's just break it down. The LEQ is a long essay question. It is, it, you're given a question and you're required to pull as much historical evidence out of thin air and or your brain that you possibly can within a certain time limit. Uh, you have to stick to a certain time period. You have to contextualize. You have to come up with a thesis, a bunch of, you know, required data. And hopefully you even get it complex and you're good. The DBQ, on the other hand, is a document-based question. Yes, there is a factor of pulling information out of thin air, aka your brain, uh, when we're talking about outside evidence, but the rest of it comes from the documents, and that's really a good thing, and I'll tell you why. Now, the DBQ 
is your best bet this year because of the documents, okay? It's the documents that are going to save you because you don't have to just pull it out of thin air, out of your brain, right? You are given the information to make your argument. All you have to pull out of thin air is gonna be your contextualization, which we'll talk about, and some outside evidence. You can do this, it's totally doable. So the fact that it's a DBQ, no matter how short a time period you have for it, is a good thing. So, moving right along. Why is DBQ important? Most years it's pretty important because it makes up a good chunk of 60% of the AP exam. This year in 2020, it's everything because it's the only thing you've got. We're just getting a DBQ. We have, we have a short time period to do one thing. So, Honing up on your, boning up on your DBQ skills, super important, which is why you're here. Appreciate you joining me. So let's break it down. Let's break down the DBQ for 2020 because it is different than the usual DBQ. What's the time limit? Normally in DBQ land, right, you normally in your AP exam, you have 60 minutes to do the DBQ. Suggested 15 minutes to read the documents, 45 minutes to write the essay. Great. No problem. This year, you have 45 minutes. That's it. You have 45 minutes to write the essay, you have five minutes to turn it in, and then you're done. Now, <clears throat> normally, there you might think, well, maybe there's an option of questions. You know, maybe maybe I'll have you know different possible questions to answer with different sets of documents, so I can just choose what one I'm most comfortable with. No, not not this time. Uh, it's not something that ever happens. Usually, you have options with the LEQ, but there's just one question. You have one question to answer and one set of documents. Now, normally, normally every other year, there's seven documents. It used to be there were actually even more. There was a time when it was nine and even 11 documents. But lately, up in the, the last few years, it's been seven. And this year, though, you know, it's a little bit different. Well, how is it different? Well, there's only five documents. So instead of seven, there's five. And that's actually a good thing. It's less to process, it's less to understand. So, so it'll take you less time. Best practices are gonna be, well, there's several of them. We'll go over them soon, but you know, the short version is read and understand the question. Set up your contextualization before your argument. Understand the documents. Take a little time to understand the documents. Don't just skim them. And in the long run, Take your time a little bit, okay? Rushing it is not gonna help you. You're not anywhere near as smart as you actually are when you're under pressure. And that being under pressure can be tough. And you're gonna be under pressure, right? 45 minutes is not a long time, but you're gonna be okay. We're here to help. So, oh, one last question. Is there a curve? No, <laughs> the answer is maybe. Uh, in reality, every year, the DBQ and every other essay gets curbed somewhat um, by the college board. And what they do is they, you know, they do all the math and the statistics and they figure out where the normal range is and they give that a five and then you move on uh, for the overall exam, right? So, you know, in normal cases, if you get, you know, seven, five-ish of the seven point potential points, and then do well on everything else, you can get a four or five on your overall exam. That's great. This year, we don't know. We don't know. We don't know how many points you have to get out of the 10 that you've got, to, that you have available to you to get that five. We don't know. Is it, do you have to get all 10 to get a five? No, I, I can confidently say no. Do I know how many you have to get? Again, no. If I had to guess, and just a guess, seven, eight, we'll get you a five. And by that logic, five, six, that should get you a four. Five-ish gets you a three, but in reality, I don't know. I wish I did. I would love to be able to give you that information, but unfortunately I can't. So let's move on. Let's talk best practices for the DBQ, right? So, you know, you're, you're here to know how to write a DBQ, I'm here to help you. So here's what you gotta do, okay? Before you do anything else, 
before you start reading your documents, before you start thinking about your thesis, before you start writing down anything. Read and understand the question. I, I cannot emphasize this enough. Read and understand the question. Make sure you know what it's asking you. Okay. Simply skimming the question and then going through the documents being like, okay, I know what to do. No, stop. Time out. <clears throat> Wrong. You have to read and understand the question. Because if you don't, you're in danger of writing the wrong essay. Right? Jot down what you know about the question on a piece of paper or in a Google Doc or something. Write it down so you don't have to remember it. Okay? Read and understand the question, write down what you need to know, and then move on, right? Stress makes you less brilliant than you are, okay? Stress always makes you less brilliant than you are. You guys are an AP Euro. You're a brilliant bunch, no question. But stress, time limits, it's going to make you less brilliant than you actually are. So some things that you're going to do when you're reading the question. Look for what the historical thinking skill is of the question. What's a historical thinking skill? Well, that's going to be, is it compare contrast? Is it CCOT, continuity and change over time? Is it cause effect? What is it? What kind of historical thinking skill are they asking you to exercise in your, in your argument? What are the categories of your essay that you'll be writing? Is it social? Is it political? Is it government? What, what is it, right? Is it economic, right? You can write the best essay ever, ever. Wait, let me, let me roll. Third item, what time period is your argument, okay? What time period? Is it asking about the 17th century? That's the 1600s. Is it asking about the 19th century? That's the 1800s. What's the time period for your argument, right? And it's super important to understand those three things. Why? Well, you can write the best essay ever, the most glorious essay in the history of all essays, every DBQ ever. If it doesn't address the historical thinking skill or doesn't discuss the category that the question's asking, or it's out of time period, no points for you. Zero. You can get a zero on this. Now, are you going to? No, of course not. You're going to read the question and understand it. You're going to look for the historical thing to skill. You're going to know what category you have to discuss. You're going to know, you're going to do it in time period. You're going to be fine. But you got to make sure you know what you're writing about. Good. So let's continue. So some more that you, you should probably do. Read the documents. Read all of them. Okay. Now, am I saying you need to read them super de detailed? I don't think you really have the time for that per se. It really, more than likely, the docs are going to be made up of like like so, four written docs and one visual. Do I know that for sure? No, of course I don't. But just looking at the multitude of DBQs we've had since, what, 2002, something like that? So over the 18, last 18 or so years, there's always at least one visual. They like visuals at College Board. So... When you're looking over your documents, you want to take note of a few things, right? You want to know the source of the doc, who wrote it and when. You want to be able to summarize the main idea of the document as linked to the prompt, right? And that's where you come in, where comes in your category and historical thinking skill. If it's an economics question, you go through the essay, you go through the document looking for economics bits, you know, ding, 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 your control F, your command F, if you're a Mac user, um, finding the information that's relevant, and then you find everything you need. And then group your documents, okay? They're not likely to fit in, they're not likely to fit an argument in order. It's statistically super possible. Reality, probably not. It's not, not likely to go one, two, three, four, five when you're making your argument. It's, it's not. But it could. But in reality, group your documents. And you're probably going to only be able to make about two groups. So the odds are there's going to be a two-paragraph essay plus a you know opening paragraph plus an ending paragraph. So about four paragraphs, give or take. Does it matter how long it is? Not at all. Okay, there's no maximum length. Make your argument. Then you're done. Once you've read and understand the question, once you've read and understood the documents, then start writing your essay. So time-wise, what's that mean? Well, give yourself about 10 minutes to read the essay, 
okay? Read the documents. About 10 minutes. That still gives you 35 solid minutes to write your essay. And take notes on your paper or in your Google Doc or whatever. Take notes on the documents. That way you don't have to remember it while you're trying to write your essay. It's all there. All you have to do is plug and chug, right? Any of you ever heard that in math, math class? Plug and chug in the, the equation, in your chemistry class maybe. Plug and chug. You have your formula, plug and chug. So moving right along. So let's talk about the rubric, right? We, we, you know, we've, we've talked some best practices. Let's talk about the rubric itself. I do have here a sample five drop rubric for 2020. Uh, let me see if I can get it to call up. Um, I will, of course, also share a link to this with y'all so that you can download it if you're so inclined. Uh, you know, you don't have to, obviously. Uh, but here it is. That's the link for it right there in the chat box. So let's stop this screen share here. Hi, that's me. Uh, and we'll do a different one now. That's rubric we're talking about, right? Yep, yep, rubric. Cool. So this is a rubric of my own more or less design. I've gotten help from friends and things like that. Um, but it is, uh, such a thing once it pulls up, never tried switching screens before when I was live streaming. So see what happens with that. Yeah. Huh? Uh, hopefully you guys can still see me. We're still live. Good. Uh, let's try and share that screen again. Just didn't want to do it. Share. Come on. Come on. There we go. Ah, beautiful. Okay, so you'll see here, this is an AP History document-based question rubric. It is the five document, 10 point version of it. Um, this is, you know, my own creation, my own design. Uh, it's not perfect, obviously, but it will do. So going through the rubric here, uh, I do want you guys to notice a few things. First of all, um, the points that you can get, right? You're still getting one point for thesis. You're still getting one point for contextualization. It's where evidence and analysis come in that things get a little bit different, right? So first is describing the contents of at least two documents in, to understand the prompt. That gives you one point, just two documents, that's it. Now then that's, that's one point. So you've gotten your contextualization point, you've gotten your thesis point, two documents, that's three points already, great. Then you're gonna support your argument with two documents. That's another point. Support your argument, argument with two more documents. That's another point. You don't even have to use all five. Should you use all five? Absolutely. Use all five. Please use all five. Do, do yourself that favor. But in reality, you only maximum need to use four, but use all five in case you flub one. Bring in specific outside historical evidence once, another point. Do it a second time, that's another point. Boom, boom, three, four, five. That's five points right there. Wow. That's great. Now, moving right along, we have our last two bits. We last three points that we could possibly get. HAP, which is our historical evidence, audience, POV, and purpose, otherwise known as HIP or HIPPO or SOAPS, or whatever acronym your teacher likes to use. I use HAP, you know, to know what's happening. Um, so you use that once. So you source a document once, you get a point. You source the document, a second document, you get another point. And then if you happen to weave a complex and nuanced example of an essay, and it's a beautiful thing, and it's a wonderful thing, and it's just so awesome out there that you pull it off, you get complex. Great. Wonderful. So that's the rubric in a nutshell. Um, Let's 
go back to presentation. Assuming it, yeah, wunderbar. Yeah, man. Up and at him. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Good. You yeah. have lift off. So, so some tips when you're writing your essay. And this is, so this is, uh, you know, based on the rubric, you're welcome to make a copy of that and use it as you like. It is just my format. I'm sure your teachers have their own. I'm sure you've seen a billion and a half of them online. You know, I, I know that, you know, Heimler, Ritchie, you name it, they all have their own. Um, but it kind of boils down to this. You still have to get the points, right? So let's talk about getting the points. So some tips for you as far as getting those points. First of all, if you're a formula type person, if you like formulas in your uh, special sauce, we got a thesis formula from John Irish, who's written a lot of books on writing in for AP exams. Uh, and it is... Although X, because A and B, therefore Y. Although X, because A and B, therefore Y. And that is, although X, the best counter argument to the point you're going to make, because A and B, very specific bits of evidence, specific bits of evidence, such as you know, what you've grouped your uh group your documents into, this economic thing and this social thing or whatever, therefore, why, which is your argument. And your thesis should be your argument in a nutshell. It has to be specific. It has to take a stance. It has to go in a certain direction. It must be better than ish, if that makes any sense. And I'll talk more about that in a second. Your contextualization can be between 50 and 150 years prior to the time period of your argument. Give yourself, you know, that leeway. Um, you know, depending on what history you're doing, it, it, the time frame kind of changes for, you know, a push 50 to 100. For Euro, I'd say 50 to 150. For World, it can be as late as 200 years previous. And admittedly, you can, you know, contextualize way, way back. But remember, it's got to be related to the argument you're making. It's got to be relatable. It's got to be related. It's got to be specific. So taking it too far back is a waste of time. And I would do it prior to the time period of your argument instead of during or after, even though technically you can try that in uh, according to the college board. Because first of all, it's a lot easier to talk about the time period that leads up to your argument and then leave the during and after for you know sourcing points. And then secondly, if you're trying to contextualize for after, there's a good chance you'll miss the contextualization. Contextualizing previous, that's the better one. Uh, and the way to do that, you know, take two to three vocab words that that you then fully explain, be it, you know, uh, the Trans-Siberian Railroad, uh, the laissez-faire economics, whatever, right? Absolutism. Take those vocab words and then fully explain them in a couple of sentences and then connect them to your argument. There's your contextualization. Use all five documents, okay? Use all five. That way, you know, God forbid you flub one of them, you still got the other four. Don't quote the documents. Don't quote the documents. Do not quote the documents. Why? Well, simply put, it's a waste of time. The people reading your essays will know the documents back and forth. Just put a little parentheses, doc one, done. You don't need to quote the documents. Describe the documents. Show that you understand them at a higher level. Group your documents, that's another you know, tip. Use topic sentences in your paragraphs to make your argument coherent, okay? Start your paragraph with a topic so that all you're doing is filling in the details after. Some more tips, and this is, uh, we have an outline here that I've also created, and, and, and you don't have to use it, obviously, um, but by all means, feel free to. Uh, it is basically the outline that I require my students to use um, if they want to get a shot at full points 
for the uh, for their DBQs and LAQs. LAQs without a without a, an outline, my students cannot get 100%. Um, and the reason for that is so that they get themselves organized. The thing about outlines is they keep you organized. They mean that you don't have to remember everything. It's a beautiful thing, right? And you're welcome to look at that at your leisure, by all means. Um, but the reality is outlines are wonderful. Now, do they have to be super detailed? Not at all. But they help you stay organized so that all you have to do is put all the information in your essay. It's great. So, some more tips for you when you're writing your essay. Topic sentences for your paragraphs should be related to how you've grouped the documents. Outside evidence, EBOD as I like to call it, evidence beyond the documents, should be directly connected to the argument you're trying to make. And, and, and out, calling it outside evidence is kind of a tricky thing. Uh, it, it might be better to think of it as additional evidence, stuff that is not directly said in the documents, but directly related to the argument you're making. Um, simply name dropping some evidence is not using EBOD, evidence beyond the documents, to strengthen the argument, and won't earn you points. A little name drop is useless. It's a waste of your time. But doing a name drop and then explaining why it works and then connecting it to your argument, that's evidence beyond the documents. And it can't be something already mentioned in the documents. It's got to be outside evidence, okay? So names of evidence, explain it up real nice and then connect it to your argument. That's EBOD, evidence beyond the documents. So let's talk sourcing, right? Sourcing in 2020 is, uh, it's important. It's two potential points out of 10. It's literally what, 20% uh, of the entire score you can possibly get. So sourcing is taking the document and talking about what's happening in the document, or your teacher might have called it hip or hippo, same shtick, okay? So let's talk about what hap is. H is historical situation or context of the document, okay? It's the broader historical reality that created the need or possibility for your document to exist. Something to remember is the documents we read in, in DBQs for DBQs, they're from a different time, right? There's no way in the current setting that a document like that would exist or would have been written because the historical context of now is so different than it was then that the document wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been written now. But the realities of life, the, the modern times of that historical period, if you will, are what makes that document possible. Now, does that, that can be as simple as, you know, more, more racist attitudes, more chauvinist attitudes, uh, the white men's burden, blah, 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 blah. There's lots of options. But in reality, what we're looking at is the historical context that makes that document a thing. A or I, depending on what your teacher taught you, is your audience or intended audience of the document. Who was it written for? Who is the document talking to? Okay. Who's going to read it? Talking about that shows that you better understand the document. Sourcing is building complexity. It's that next level of understanding. It's that higher cognitive level of understanding the documents. First P if you will, is the purpose of the document, which is not an explanation, it's not a description of the document, it's why. Why does the document exist at all, okay? The purpose, why was it written? Why was it said? Why is it here in front of your face? And that's not, the purpose of the document is not so that AP students can write essays. That's, that, no, it's the purpose in period. So what was it made to do? The last P is going to be point of view, right? POV. The point of view of the author of the document. Why are they saying what they said the way they said? Why are they saying what they said the way they said? Their point of view, how they look at the world. A lot of times purpose and uh, intended audience uh, will mesh up together, right? They'll, 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 they'll be easily interchangeable or, or you'll end up talking about them both when you're sourcing, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But you don't have to hit 
all four sourcing points for one document. Don't do it. It's a waste of time. You don't get bonus points for working extra hard in that sort of in, in that respect. You only get points for one item of sourcing per one document. And doing more than one for one document only gets you one point. It doesn't get you a second point. Okay. Sourcing is far more than simply explaining up the document, which is what description is. It shows higher level thinking and sets you up for possible complexity points. You don't have to use all of these all of these for each document you source, you only need to use one. And if you store, source more than two document, just two documents, you're setting yourself up for a buffer. So say you source three or four documents, that's a good idea. Why? Well, simply put, if you flub one, you've got another, right? You might miss on the sourcing, but if you've done more than just two, you could still get both points, and that's a good thing. So. Moving boldly forward, let's talk about thesis. So what is a thesis anyway, right? Well, first of all, this ain't your mama's thesis, and it certainly is not your English teachers, right? In English class, you've been taught, and it's been drilled into your head over and over and over and over that a thesis is simply, you know, a taste. A general statement that you will then develop as your essay continues. And wrong! Not in history. In history, your thesis needs to be jam-packed with information. Is your argument in miniature? It is has so much information that all you're doing after you write that thesis is just filling in the details. That's it, right? In AP Euro, your thesis should be your argument in miniature. It needs to be specific. It should have a direction. It should take a position. It should be something that someone can say, I agree with that or I disagree with that. And keep in mind, you, the AP reader that's reading your DBQ does not have to agree with your position at all. They don't have to agree. It's okay. It's not necessary. They are trained to be objective, right? It doesn't matter if they agree with the argument you're making. It just matters that you're making an argument, right? And for the, again, for those of you that really like formulas, and I have some students that use this formula when they're doing their theses, and it works. It's very functional, and if it ain't baroque, don't fix it, right? Um, you know, Euro joke. Um, anyway, wow, it's a crowd. Um, so the formula for, for a thesis, again, by John Irish is although X, that's the greatest counterargument to your argument, because A and B, two specific bits of evidence that you're going to then discuss the heck out of, therefore Y, your argument, and that's why you're right. Okay? And that is thesis. Now let's talk about contextualization, right? Because that's why you're here. We're talking about the DBQ and contextualization and thesis and all that good junk. So what is contextualizing your argument? You know, that's that's the big question. What is it? so Let's take things out of DBQ land for a moment, and let's uh, let's put it in some more some different terms. You ever told your friends a story, and while you're telling that story, or when you're about to tell that story, you realize, wait, 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 time out. I got to tell you guys a few things before I tell you this story, so that this story makes any sense at all. That is contextualizing your story. That is giving background information so that your story makes sense. That's contextualization. You're giving background information so that your argument makes more sense. Now, the context of your AP Euro essay should cover, should be between 50 to 150-ish years before the time period required by your client. Now, According to the college board, it can be during and after as well. But like I said before, trying to do that is oftentimes not super effective as far as, you know, setting up your contextualization. And if you save the during and after for the essay itself, you can use those for, you know, contextualizing your documents or setting up complexity right? Super helpful. Because if you want that complexity point, you got to set yourself up for it. 
Now, your con contextualization should be directly connected to the prompt and thus your argument. It's got to make sense. It can't just be, you know, four score and seven years ago, yada, 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 blah. And now we're going to talk about World War II. No, it doesn't work that way. It does, that doesn't fit, right? It's got to fit with your argument. It's got to fit with time period. It's got to come right before and be relevant. And yes, again, technically your contextualization could be about the same time period, it could be about the time period before, during, or after your argument, but the latter two, again, are fair to use for sourcing and complexity. So, I have talked for the last 35 minutes or so. I probably have exhausted all of you and probably talked far too fast. I, agree, I admit this, I speak very quickly, I apologize. Do you have any questions I can answer for you? There seems to be one in the whole poll thingy. What are some places we get practice DBQs for 2020? So, again, where are some places that we can get practice DBQs for 2020? Thank you for asking that, Aditi. Um, so, there, hmm, practice DBQs are popping up kind of all over the place. I know that Heimer's put out a few, Richie's put out, Tom Richie's put out a few. Um, I know the College Board is supposedly putting out a few in theory. Um, but another thing you can do is take some of the old ones from years previous and edit them, your, them yourselves. So, you know, take the question and then, you know, print out the whole DBQ, right? The, 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 the question, the documents, all of it. And then get rid of two of them, right? You have seven documents, get rid of two of them. Pick two. It doesn't really matter which two and then form your argument accordingly. That's another thing you can do. There's a lot of options there. So yeah, that's one way you can do it. So yeah, that. Um, are there any other questions I can answer, please? I'm here for you. We have another 23 minutes available to us. What can I tell you? You know, Harper asked, I'm gonna ask it too. How's everybody feeling about the exam? I know there's only four of you here at this point, which is uh, not a lot, but that gives us, you know, direct attention. What can I do for you? What can I, what answers can I answer for you? What can I tell you? Gabby, Aditi, Harper, Ethan, any of you, what, what can I tell you? What can I answer for you? Anything burning in the back of your mind? Anything you want me to review from what I've already talked about? Oh, awesome, Aditi, thank you. Kind of a bummer that this isn't like Zoom where I can actually hear your voices or see y'all, but you know, it is what it is. Ah, here we go. Another question by Dee. Thank you. Have you heard of the third paragraph the College Board has introduced for the complexity point? Where are your thoughts about that? Okay, so have I heard of the third paragraph, et cetera, et cetera, the College Board has introduced? So I've heard of it being a thing. In reality, hmm, how to put it? Complexity ideally is something that's woven in and out of your essay throughout. It, having it just be a paragraph at the end, oftentimes is not really gonna set you up for actual complexity. It might, depending on how amazing that paragraph is, but the reality is they're not going to, you know, require a third paragraph to get the complexity point. Ideally, your argument should be nuanced, it, nuanced, Oof, yikes. Nuanced, it should be complex, it should be detailed, it should show a really high level understanding of the argument you're making, the documents that you've used, and the overall historical thinking skill that you're, that you're arguing. So can that be done in this third paragraph? Technically, yes. And John Irish's um, formula kind of sets you up for complexity because it takes the counter argument and then disproves it. Right. Um, but the reality is that you're better off trying to weave a complex argument 
throughout your essay as opposed to trying to chunk in a third paragraph and hoping that'll get to the complexity point. I hope that answered your question. Uh, anybody else? It's a great question, by the way, Didi. Thank you so much for the last two questions. You've been fantastic. So Didi's asked a couple, Gabby, Harper, Ethan, any of you guys? Ooh, another one. This one's also from Aditi, thank you. So do you need a counter argument in your essay or can you just have two body paragraphs supporting your argument? So that counter argument formula is just one way you can present your thesis. It's not necessary. It does set you up for complexity, but it's not required. And, and, and all things considered, if you gotta pick and choose what not to focus on, chill on complexity, right? Get every other point. Get your thesis. Get your contextualization. Get your documents. Boom, 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 boom. Get your EBOD, your evidence beyond the document, your, your outside evidence, your additional evidence, if you will. And source the heck out of a few documents. You can get nine out of ten points at that point. So that counter argument is just one way to potentially set you up for complexity. But the reality is, and I've, and I've actually, like, I've talked to a lot of AP readers. I'm hoping to be one someday myself. I'm not there yet. They haven't asked me to do it yet. Um, open, hashtag open. Uh, you know, was that? Uh, hashtag goals. Um, <laughs> um, but I know a bunch of folks that do read for the AP exam for multiple subjects. And all kidding aside, what they tell them is you'll know it when you see it. That's what the College Board says. You'll know a complex argument when you see it which is super helpful, but reality it's not, and we know this, so yeah. So next question, ooh, Gabby, thank you, new one. So what's the best way to incorporate a document with a piece of art or map or something into your argument? Great question. So it's gonna come down to what the art or map or whatever that visual actually is, right? So that visual is going to tell you a lot. It, uh, they they seem to really like um, art with a like a purpose or a message, um, as opposed to you know something biblical per se. Um, they like political cartoons a lot. They like that sort of thing a whole lot. Now, is that the only thing they'll do? They like maps too. Um, but like for example, for example. On the 2019 World um, DBQ, right, one of the documents was a map of Africa with the proposed railroad that uh, Cecil, Cecil DeMille, I believe his name was Cecil B. DeMille, yeah, the guy that set up apartheid functionally, um, wanted to build from Cairo to Cape Town. And so that document could then be, be used to talk about how they wanted to bring, you know, connect the British holdings, even though it was through French holdings and basically the holdings that weren't theirs, come heck or high water, and how they, you know, wanted to bring civilization to the entire African continent during the scramble for Africa, things like that. So it kind of just depends what that visual says, does, is, to how to bring it into your argument. Um, you know, it could be something like, you know, there's uh, there's one on the College Board site with uh, Cardinal Rochelot, um, and it has to do with the Thirty Years' War. You know, they're holding back uh, the Lion of England and the um, Hawk of the uh, HRE, Holy Roman Empire. And you can use that to talk about how France in the Thirty Years' War didn't actually take the Catholic side, but instead took their took a political stance and went against the HRE, um, even though they were fellow Catholics. So it, it depends on it. I hope that answered it, answered your question for you. Next question is Aditi again. Thank you. Uh, is it necessary to have a conclusion? <sighs> Technically, no. It is not necessary to have a conclusion. Is it helpful to have a conclusion? Yes, because your conclusion is going to tie up your argument in a nice little bow. What I always suggest to my students is actually uh, to restate your thesis in a different way in your conclusion. And the reason for that is actually having to do with where your thesis appears in the thesis point. What it is is like so. 
according to the College Board, your thesis can appear either at the beginning or the end of the essay. Those are the two locations it can be, and it's the only thing that they say very hardcore beginning, end, that's it. So you do your thesis at the beginning, and you know you do your conceptualization, you present your thesis, and you make your argument, it's all fantastic. At the end, when you're doing your conclusion, you restate your thesis, and you realize that the thesis you originally wrote is good, but the way you're restating it is far more effective. So at that point, that first thesis might not have gotten the point, but you're restating the thesis does. So at that point, you know, you've gotten the thesis point, even though you might have missed it that first shot. So that's why you should have a conclusion. Is it necessary? Technically, no, but tying up your argument in a nice bow is always is always good. That answered it. And another question by Aditi. Thank you so much for being so participatory. All of you, thank you, thank you. Uh, personally, do you have a prediction on what topic the DBQ will be based on on past trends? So, so sadly, I can't even possibly hope to guess. Um, what I can tell you, though, is what it won't be on, right? It's not going to be about Europe prior to the Black Plague because your Euro books don't cover that. It's not going to be about the time period after basically 1900. So it's not going to be about World War I, the interwar period, World War II, the Cold War, any of that. Because the College Board's already confirmed, because of the whole COVID-19 coronavirus nutso shelter-in-place shelter situation, they can't reliably expect students to have covered it because most students haven't been in school since March, right? And timeline-wise, teaching line-wise, most teachers have only gotten to about 1900 by March. That's the realistic expectation. So while I can't tell you what it's going to be about, like I said, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not going to be pre-plague and it's not going to be after 1900. Yes, everything else is fair game. It might be a religious topic. It might be governance. It might be economics. What is it going to be for sure? I couldn't possibly tell you reliably because if you take a look at the past essays, they've varied all over the place. They do like uh, governance essays a lot, you know, how, how um, political structures are built or how states have grown or fallen, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we can predict they'll use it this time. Um, so, I'd love to be able to say that, yeah, I know exactly what they're going to do, but I, I, I can't rely on it. I wish I could. All right. Thank you so much for all the questions. Anybody else want to ask something since, uh, you know, I'm here, I'm, I'm available. Uh, Gabby and Aditi have been kind enough to ask all the questions so far, mostly Aditi. Thank you. Uh, Harper, Ethan, you want you got, you got anything you want to ask? I mean, Harper, it seems you're feeling okay about the, uh, the DBQ, are you still feeling okay about it? Are you feeling better about it? Or are you guys feeling better about it? I mean, you know, <laughs> of the 28 people that registered, you know, I think I had a max of six or seven. Um, you guys have stuck with me till the very end, and I appreciate that. What can I do for you? I've, you've got my undivided attention, which is saying something because I'm kind of ADHD. Oh, thank you, Ethan. Uh, for evidence, how should we support an argument in response to the prompt to get a second point? Ah, so supporting your argument. So how do you support your argument uh, in response to the prompt regarding the uh, documents? So supporting your argument is taking your description of, okay, let me rephrase. If you have a frying pan and a spatula, right, and they're sitting on your counter, describing the documents is like saying, there's a frying pan, there's a spatula. Great. Supporting your argument with the documents is then taking that frying pan and spatula and making some bacon and eggs. I don't personally eat bacon, I'm Jewish, but you know, you get the idea, eggs at least. So. Supporting your argument is taking the description of the document and then plugging it into your argument, connecting it to your argument so that you further your argument and you develop your argument. So it's more than just describing the document, it's better 
it, it's it's taking that description and then using it. I hope that makes sense. I hope that helps. Uh, if the prompt asks to what extent, how should I build my thesis? If the prompt asks to what extent, how should I build my thesis? Thank you, Gabby. Um, so to what extent means how much? Usually to what extent is going to be um, a CCOT question, like continuity and change over time, how much things continued or changed, or it's going to be how much how much the effect was different than the cause, if that makes any sense at all. I don't know if I'm wording that right. So wording your thesis in that case, so to what extent, is to talk about how much. Is it a to a great extent? Is it to a minimal extent? Is it not at all? Something I always ask my students, and it's something I have them do literally on a daily basis, is I, I call it a tweet. And it, <laughs> tweety is a funny word. So welcome, Ethan. Tweety is spelled like this, T-W-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-
ask any questions you can you can think of. I'll be here doing it for an hour. Uh, and literally no lecture, just questions and answers. Uh, I do hope you'll find that helpful, and I hope to see you guys there. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, Rudman out. Thank you for thinking fiveable. <laughs>